Good afternoon, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dean Godson. I'm Director of Policy Exchange. The attendance uh, today in the middle of a general election campaign for this uh, particular subject is indicative, of course, of its enduring <coughs> importance. And uh, I'm reminded of uh, the famous line of Henry Kissinger, not unique to Kissinger, but the most recent famous reformulator of this line, where he said, the verdict of history will depend on who writes the history. And for many years now, there has been a massive imbalance in historical narratives, in media narratives, against the security forces generally, and most particularly the much maligned, uh, much uh, wronged Royal Ulster Constabulary and successor organization, the PSNI, of which uh, Dr. William Matchett was one of the most uh, distinguished uh, servants. I've known of him for many years. It's the first time I've had the privilege of being able uh, to meet him. We knew each other, or of each other, I should say, more, more accurately uh, when I worked for the Daily Telegraph when I was always uh, proud to play a part in uh, commemorating the service and sacrifice of that organization. And uh, this is uh, his account. I know many of you have been buying it here. Um, I'd urge <coughs> you all, if you haven't yet bought one yet, uh, to do so because it contains many important uh, facts, analyses, which I think will serve to rectifying that imbalance. So without further ado, I give you over to William Matchett and then we'll have a question and answer session afterwards where he'll be able to go into some of the themes here in greater detail. William, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Dean and Policy Exchange for inviting me. And I'd also like to uh, thank Peter Castles and the Kennedy Institute at Maynooth University for actually putting me forward to, to speak today. I was told uh, the invite here was a few weeks ago and I was asked to, to speak about a number of points, one of them being the book, another being Northern Ireland, some recent articles and interviews and then the legacy. So it's four sections which I think I've got about 45 minutes, 50 minutes to do, double correct? <laughs> so the book which uh, is at the back of the room. Essentially the book was part of a, a long process of, of research from, and believe me, I, I, I'm not a natural academic. So it started off with a master's and then a PhD, and it essentially it was looking at the challenges of placing an armed conflict. And at the end of uh, the book, uh, I published a, a short article in an international journal, but I soon found out nobody actually reads international journals. So it, it didn't really reach anyone. So the, I was told by a very good friend who would, would have loved this turnout today, Austin Hunter. Austin was a, a BBC journalist and an and a editor for the newsletter. And Austin kept me going to write the book, uh, regardless of whatever to say it. Just try and write it, write it for the public, write it for your the sort of people like your mother and father, your, your, your sort of sister. So write it in, in a language to a broad audience that they can understand. Don't write it for the academic community, he says, because nobody will want to buy it, nobody will want to read it. Um, and Austin would have been delighted with this about trying to get the message out. Unfortunately, uh, he passed away not long after the first book launch in, in Belfast he's seen getting the message essentially across the Irish Sea as something very important. And when we're looking at the name of the book, Secret Victory, essentially what, what the book argues is controversial. It says that the IRA lost. Militarily, they were defeated. And that's controversial because of a number of reasons. One, what has been perpetuated and promoted largely by the British government, but also the Clinton administration, by Dublin, and by a lot of people who associate themselves with the peace process, is that all it took to end a conflict was to talk to terrorists. And security just disappeared completely off the radar. Number two, it actually contests 
a narrative that the security effort was repressive, that is, that the British Army and the police were brutal, uh, that they were a sectarian instrument of the, uh, an old British empire, British colonialists, everything that is bad, that people would say was bad with the, the old days of Britain, are saying this is what the security response looked like. It was unfair, uh, it was biased, it was sectarian, and it was wrong. Number three, which is controversial, again it goes back to the peace process. It wasn't, the book argues, it wasn't Tony Blair or John Major who essentially brought about the peace. But it was all the hard yards under Margaret Thatcher during the 80s that actually set everything up, that brought the provisional IRA to its knees, where Major and then Blair benefited from all that hard, hard work in the early years. What I would ask, if you think about that in general terms, and you think about the majority of people I, I, I surmise here from England or London, how would you cope, how would, how would England, how would London cope with 1,500 terrorist attacks per week? Because that's what was happening in Northern Ireland at the height of the conflict in 1972. And you're, you're looking at, what, 18,000 terrorist incidents in a year. And I don't mean, I don't mean fake bomb calls, hoax bomb calls, I mean real terrorist incidents. The consistency in the pace of conflict is breathtaking. And that is a low, that's the lowest of the low intensity conflicts. But it gives you, it gives you an idea of just the, the hot pace of it. I can recall being in London in 7-7, uh, coincidentally. And I remember uh, talking to a senior Metropolitan Police officer. And they have the Metropolitan Police, like the rest of the UK, they have the Human Rights Act, they have RIPA, uh, which dictates how your covert agencies operate. If they'd have had another terrorist attack, they would have had to essentially derogate out of that legislation because they actually cut the bureaucracy of it as too great. And that was, what, two, three terrorist incidents. So imagine if you're getting, was it nearly 50 a day? So that's, the book sets out, you can see the book is on the defensive because it's contesting claims. So you're, re you're reacting to a very popular narrative that the peace process and peacemakers like Martin McGuinness is what brought about peace. And the whole security aspect of how the British Army and the police uh, work with each other to bring that about has been totally lost. Policing by nature is controversial. I don't know many police officers are here today, but policing at the best of times is controversial. An armed conflict is controversial. So the troubles was always going to be very controversial because you had the police essentially towards the end leading the security response. The provisional IRA, that new brand of republicanism, was defeated. Now if we look at Northern Ireland, or what a lot of people back home would call the North. Insurgency forces people to pick sides. Now, what I mean by that, when it, when it came to studying the troubles, when I was in the police, I never heard anyone refer to Northern Ireland as an insurgency. I didn't know what the overall strategy was. I was just, when I was in uniform, I was just part of a, of a, of a team and you had to do your bit, but there was no idea of what the overall strategy was. Insurgency, what is insurgency? Insurgency, now everyone here knows what an insurgency is. It's a, it's a violent criminal uprising, it's trying to overthrow the state. We can see it today in what insurgency looks like in different countries across the world, but that's what was happening in Northern Ireland. And it's much more complex than just a terrorist threat. It's, it's far more sophisticated. And it forces people to pick sides. And President Bush referred to it as a zero-sum game. Now that might seem harsh. Uh, I spoke to an audience about a couple of years ago in Washington. And the way I tried to describe it, if you think of the, 
the UAS, like a lot of the inter international community, they're looking at um, how do they, the, the support that jihadists are getting within the sort of Sunni Arab world for Al-Qaeda and those types of networks. So they were looking at the Saudis and the, the different Gulf states, how they support or fund these extremists. And what I was saying was, well, okay, just rewind. Uh, the, the lad I was chatting to was a, a colonel and Irish-American descent from, from New York. And I was saying, so you think of Irish-America, what way did they look at the provisional IRA? That's the way you're going to have a lot of Saudis looking at Al-Qaeda, etc. So you can now see why, uh, back in the day, why some Catholic bishops on the East Coast actually refused to condemn um, an atrocity such as narrow water. They condemned it, but in the same breath, they condemned all types of violence, as in they bring the security forces in and give that degree of equivocation. And I know Garrett Fitzgerald, the Taoiseach, was particularly outraged by this, where he was actually asking, no, just specifically condemn this attack. And what, what you find is with the US, along with the British, found this moderate aspect, this passive support for terrorism, it actually, it, it causes the whole thing to keep happening. So on one hand, you can't support the cause of a terrorist organization, the IRA, and at the same time then try to condemn them. It's got to be one or the other, which is a, a brutal reality. That's why it's just not so plain cut as terrorists. Uh, we don't support terrorists, but if you support the cause, you actually are supporting an insurgency. And terrorism is guerrilla tactics. And in Ireland, it's been, that's what it's been like for 1800, from the 1800s, early 1800s. The threat of the kind seen by the, by the provisional IRA had, was unprecedented. It really hadn't been seen anywhere before, and it caught everybody off guard. Nobody really knew how to, to respond. And this brings you into policing. What does policing a conflict look like? Policing, when we're looking out there uh, at Westminster Bridge from the attack that happened not that long ago here, you've, in London, you have a different form of policing. You have the, the British Bobby style of policing, which is what every nation should aspire to have, consent-based policing. The public, the community support the police. The police do not need to be armed because the community is their greatest defence. That's your greatest weapon. That's how you promote the rule of law. What does that look like in a conflict when a sizable section of the community do not support the rule of law? When they hold back support for the police? How do you support a community where a section of the community are looking to murder the police? Are looking to bring the state to its knees? So it's a different form of policing that is needed. Intelligence-led, we talk about intelligence-led policing, um, and today it's very popular. Uh, I was talking to, to someone just, just before uh, I started this, and we're looking at, well, what is intelligence-led policing? You have to look at what is the definition of intelligence? Today, intelligence, I think this is a broad audience where you could have intelligence if you've been looking at a barber jacket on the internet and the next day you sort of continue your search, barber jackets come up on your right and you're going, essentially intelligence is now processed information. It's about analysis. Uh, it's about defining what this person likes, what they don't like. But intelligence in a conflict is about knowing what the enemy is going to do before they do it. It's, it's a totally different meaning. What is intelligence-led policing look like in a conflict is totally different to what it looks like here in London at this moment in time. What intelligence-led policing look like in Northern Ireland is dramatically different to what it looks like in Northern Ireland today. There's an aspect, and if you go back, and you go back to the times of, was it the ancient Chinese warlord Sun Tzu to the, what is it, before Christ, they talk about informers within terrorist organizations. And that, that's what Michael Collins called, I said, a pearl beyond price. And essentially that's how the IRA of Collins 
um, partitioned Ireland. That's how the that's how essentially they defeated the sort of a British approach in in the War of Independence. So if informers within a terrorist organization, essentially within within the troubles, that was the decisive factor in the intelligence war. And the intelligence war essentially is what defeated the provisional IRA. But there's also another aspect, there's the Bletchley Park factor. If you were just relying purely on people within terrorist organisations, it was actually been quite easily defeated. But if you've got other factors in there, whether it's eavesdropping, intercepts of communications, surveillance, etc., all of a sudden the opponent is never that sure where the intelligence has come from. So it starts to mask. There's a diversity of intelligence where you can probably today in the, the 30th of on, anniversary of Loch Gaul, uh, I know this morning I was reading different conspiracy theories about how did the uh, special branch know, how, why were the SAS and Loch Gaul at that particular moment, that particular time. Some people will say it was an informer. Some people will say it was a, a device in somebody's house. Somebody will say it was a tracking device in somebody's vehicle. Other people will say it was just carelessness on behalf of the team. But the bottom line is they don't know. Everything's maybe it was this, maybe it was that. And that, that was probably the beauty about the intelligence attack back then. You can never put your finger on how it happened, which means it keeps, it keeps the opponent unstable. The big thing with policing a conflict, if you think about ideology, and I know what really hurts innocent victims of terrorism at the moment, uh, women like Anne Travers. I don't know, I know a few people here have met Anne Travers and she's a, an inspirational lady whose sister was brutally executed by the provisional IRA and they tried to murder her, uh, her mother and her father. Her father was a magistrate, so her father was upholding the rule of law. And why was that happening? Because the ide ideology of physical force republicanism, the, the provisional brand of it, was to legitimize murder. So you have people indoctrinated into an organization to legitimize murder. What directly contests that is the rule of law. And your most physical outworking of the rule of law are police constables, are uniform officers on the beat. That's what contests ideologies like this. So you can see in a conflict, if you're putting the rule of law as the weapon to defeat an insurgency, that involves putting the police in the front line. The IRA was allergic to the rule of law. And it was vulnerable to the rule of law. And if you, you look at it today, how many IRA leaders are coming out and saying, I was a leader in the IRA? There's none of them are coming out and saying that. Even Martin McGuinness, I think he was saying he left the IRA at a certain point in time. And why are they not saying that? Because the rule of law had boxed them in their corner. Because to say that was a crime, was to admit it was a crime. I have a, I have a quote here from, I need to put my glasses on for this. This is from when they the set up special branch in the Metropolitan Police in the 1800s, after uh, uh, the Fenian Rising, essentially, when terrorism all of a sudden was uh, imported into the UK. As a book. And they were talking about, I suppose, people like myself. <laughs> yeah, never thought about that road before. None of these men had liberal backgrounds. The backgrounds they did come from may not only have been incompatible with liberal values, but they were less likely to nurture them than most. The empire was coming home. Liberal Britain was being placed by outsiders, or at least by men from its fringes where that sort of li liberalism ran very thin. And the point of trying to get that quote out is, it's a tough form of policing. That RUC, RIC model is a tough form of policing. 
And it's not to say that it doesn't cherish liberal values, but it's, it's unafraid of upsetting the sensitivities around that issue, which again is controversial. Recent articles and interviews. The academic article uh, was published, I think it was called Democracy and Security, which is a, it's a very good journal. And it was titled Security Missing from the Northern Ireland Model. And it explained how uh, Prime Minister Blair, uh, Jonathan Powell, and different other people had said, this is, this is how we delivered peace to the people of Northern Ireland. I don't think security was mentioned once in their explanation. So when these people were talking to different folk in the Middle East or whatever, what, what were they actually telling them about how you bring a, a peace process or how do you achieve a peace process if you don't include security? And I'm not saying here that security was the be all and end all. And I'm not saying that security was perfect. I'm not saying that is some of the criticism of special branch, the British Army or the police is not valid. But what I'm saying is there is a security element. What does effective security look like? You can't try and explain what happened in Northern Ireland without explaining this aspect. An article that seemed to do very well was a uh, Martin McGuinness was no Mandela. And without, without looking at Martin McGuinness in his latter years, and I was, doing a, I was doing a piece of work there a few weeks ago, and it was a, a lad sort of from Hereford, and he said, right, okay, now that he's dead, tell me, was he a tight? And I said, I have absolutely, I don't know. I genuinely, I have no idea, and I don't want to know. But I threw the question back at him about McGuinness. I'm saying, right, so there's an aspect, you look at him in his early years, he was a brutal, merciless figure. And without question, him and another gentleman controlled the provisional movement with an iron hand. There was nobody going against him. So the likes of the Patsy Gillespie incident and different other horrors, you're going, oh, well, that was, if he wasn't a former, was that a good thing? Was that a bad thing? You're going, but what if, when he started to go the political route, what if he was recruited then, and then he started to convince the movement to go this road? Would that change your opinion of him, if he went at that time? And as I said, I don't know whether he was or not. But it's, the question is, at what point Morton McGuinness at some point did change. What I was dealing with here wasn't whether he was an informer or not. It was looking at the eulogies to, to Morton for his later life without people qualifying what he had done to get there. It, it was nearly we were reward, rewarding a, an arsonist firefighter, somebody who had sell, set the building ablaze and was now sort of helping put it out and we're going, that was a great thing to do. And it's not to take away from the way provisional leaders have moved forward in the peace process at the later end, but it was to point out that, there was, that they were forced into that position because they had been brought to their knees militarily. Another uh, aspect was uh, looking at the way we're treating our, our heroes today. I would say old soldiers and old cops from 1998 have been hounded. It's now described as a, a witch hunt. And probably across here now it's getting more press than it ever did. But from as soon as the agreement was signed, it was investigation after investigation uh, into the police. And now they're sort of they're, they seem to be going harder with old soldiers. And you can you can see some of these legacy cases starting to come up. And I did an article I think it was was last week. And it was a, about a lad, Colin Marks, who was shot dead in, the, in a covert operation. I don't call it undercover because undercover is a totally different thing. And you'll find a lot of the media, etc., get the two confused. You know, about how do you coordinate an armed response team and a surveillance team, actually, which actually takes quite a bit of doing. Undercover is totally separate. So Colin Marks was shot dead. And 
the, the point I was trying to make in the article was because the police ombudsman has not listened to old police officers where they've said the, these were standard operating procedures. If we had challenged a surveillance operator who's in plain clothes, and we'll say it's a, a hostile area, a Republican area, say somewhere like West Belfast, so if we challenge them there, if we just let them go, the public would know it's one of our guys. So what you had to do, you had to keep up the pretense that they were arrested. So at times you'd put a set of cuffs on them, you put them into the back of the car, that maintained their cover because there was very, very few surveillance operators. And you're looking at two years to train one. So the last thing you want to do is blow your surveillance operators. Now what happened with the, the Colin Marks is being reinvestigated because a witness, they say it's a new witness, don't know if it's a new witness, but a witness has come forward to turn around and say they've seen a person with three police officers being walked down the road. And all I was trying to say was, well, is this one explanation? Is this what they have saw? The, the problem is that different inquiries aren't listening to what the practices were during a conflict. So they're bringing maybe what they, what is happening today in London, and they're judging these people by, this is what you should have done. The other aspect was Loch Gaul, again, it's the 30th anniversary today, and it was, it was trying, to, it's trying to highlight where people say that it could have been stopped, that these people could have been arrested. I would, I would turn around and go, hi. Anybody here, anybody here who has ever been in that situation and you're told, and the lads, I've interviewed most of these lads who were in that police station and part of the team, and I have yet to come up, or any of them have to come up with an answer to go, how else could you have done this? And the whole thing is, I feel as a, as a, a guy, a Clements, he's a minister back home, not sure if he's Presbyterian or Methodist, and his, his father a, was murdered by the IRA in Ballygally, and they took his Ruger revolver off him, and one of the terrorists at Loch Gaul had the revolver. A lot of people named the wrong guy, but one of the terrorists had a revolver, and the revolver had been fired, believe it or not, when they were attacking the station. But that, that man believed that that operation was kept in the shelf. So when it was politically opportune, what they could do is, whether it was Margaret Thatcher, who would have been that time to go, right, just make that happen. Give the provisional IRA a bloody, no a bloody nose. But it didn't happen like that. That's not the way the process worked. It was tactically driven, which means it came from the ground up. If you look at, and again, it's back into your definitions of intelligence, your intelligence models. Your intelligence model today is top down, which actually suits a lot of police commanders because you can get your statistics out. You know, on average, we clear so many burglaries a month, so you can play with your stats. Bottom up is totally different. So the first, there's somebody described it in cruder terms than this. But essentially, the first opportunity to actually stop this unit was taken, and that was their only opportunity. So it didn't, whereas this minister was thinking they could have done it any time, it just didn't, it didn't work like that. And again, how many people have actually put themselves in that position? And if, if, you, think, if you think about that intelligence today, what would the Yanks do? You think about it, what would the Yanks do? They'd have probably had a drone up there, a bit of missile. What would the Yanks do with 250 on the runs coming across the border, regularly murdering people on the border? There'd probably been, a, again, a drone strike. The way it was done when they were in Iraq and went into Syria, etc. Or the way they're doing with the Taliban and the, uh, going into Pakistan. Legacy. And the, the question I would ask is, how have we treated our heroes? Personally, I think, it's, I think it's shameful. I think it's another disgrace. And what's captured it this past while, and I think this, the state has a big hand in this. I don't put it all down to the superb propaganda machine, a Republican movement, who can actually influence liberal journalists, um, who will run with sexy headlines to go, dirty war, collusion, shoot to kill because that sells newspapers. 
I don't necessarily blame that aspect. The state, there was a guy on, can't remember his name, Knopfler, whatever about that disappeared by Captain Robert Narrick. Robert Narrick disappeared in 1977 and was given a horrible end. I would safely say they'll never find the man's body because the Republican movement totally hate this guy. They hate that sort of special forces type. So much of what they've demonized, now it wasn't good enough to, to abduct, torture and execute this man and disappear his body so he can't be given a Christian burial. They demonized him. They linked him to every seditious attack by loyalists. Even King's Mill, where you had the, the, the last survivor, an old man, uh, Mr. Black, can't remember his first name, and he's coming up, you know, I heard an English voice, and the whole thing, it must have been Robert Nierak. And you're going, so we blame Robert Nierak for murdering, what is it, 10 Protestant workers. It was like Nierak was blamed for everything. But if you actually look at his record, which this guy did, his military record, on this date, of King's Mill, he was here. On this date, he was somewhere else. He couldn't have been there. And this man also got witnesses who actually confirmed, yes, he wasn't there. So an aspect, there was, I agree, uh, this man was, he was putting a po across the point that, yes, there's aspects to do with national security. There's things you can't say, you can't put in the public domain. That's a given. But there's some points that you can turn around and go, Actually, we can put this general point out there just to stop this becoming a bigger myth and, and, and gathering momentum, which it shouldn't. There's been a one-sided approach to the past. Um, it's not just my opinion. I would say it's a, a commonly held view. There's also a definition of victim in Northern Ireland that just makes absolutely no sense. Where we now have eight guys who had military rifles, wearing balaclavas and a stolen digger with a 400 pound bomb are considered victims. Nowhere else in the world does anybody consider them a victim except this peace process in Northern Ireland. What I would say about the statute of limitations which is quite topical at the moment, uh, Ben Laurie, the editor of the, the newsletter, came out with a good proposal. If you think of from 1998, how much has been spent against uh, investigating the state, right? Stop all investigations into the state. Now look at the terrorist organizations. So the terrorist organizations killed 90% of, or responsible for 90% of the killings. So basically multiply that figure by nine and start to investigate these terrorist organizations. And then when we reach parity, we continue on that 90 10 split. That was his proposal. He says, if we want equality, if we sort of want respect for all sides, that's the way we should progress. Personally, I feel that uh, the British government is going to be pulled on the punch here if they, if they give a de facto amnesty for, for the military and for the security forces, where the provisional IRA will be fit to turn around and go, they were as bad as us. That's me just summing up then. The book would have turned around as uh, Donald Trump, the US president, has said. What I would say the book exposes fake news and false facts. Should that be from something as simple as like Loch Gaul, where people have written about seven weapons when it was nine, they've written about a JCB digger when it was a Ford digger. They've written about 50 SAS when there was 26. They've written about a police station was not occupied when it was occupied. How on earth, if you get all those facts wrong, how can you trust her conclusions? So I'd say the book challenges false facts. It also shows the British had a fantastic model. And traditionally, the British, it was a navy, a strong navy, a small expeditionary army. And they went to India, went to different parts. What did they set up? A police model. That police model was your RIC, RUC police model, which actually introduced the rule of law 
and a lot of these nations still have it and it's they've introduced the rule of law so it worked and the international community after 9-11 was looking towards Britain but unfortunately by that stage we were looking at other aspects to go well maybe we just all we have to do now is talk to these people and we'll achieve peace so the security element and how the military and the police aligned and what it actually took from a security viewpoint to stabilize a nation was completely lost and Britain sadly had no interest what I would say to sum up if all it takes to end a conflict is to talk to terrorists how did that work out for us in Iraq and Afghanistan? Thank you, Dean. Thank you.